Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 254, The Remote, read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, you might find yourself shut out of your body. Johannes Voss ripped the transcranial interface off of his sweat-soaked head, then jumped up, examining his hands, expecting the sensations to stop. But instead, the pain continued. Blood dripped from scratches in his palms and a deep gash in his forehead. Neither should have been there. It was simply impossible. He hadn't left the room in hours. Johans dabbed at the wounds with tissues to staunch the bleeding, then, exhausted and confused, collapsed back onto his remoting chair. That was when he noticed the trail of blood leading down the hall to the door. He reached up and touched his head, making sure that, indeed, he had taken the interface off and was disconnected from the cerebral net. He had been remoting to attend a presentation by the Venice Water Authority on the new updates to the Mose flood control system. Distracted by a passing tour bus, Johans had caused his rented remote to trip and fall, instinctually throwing out the remote's arms to protect themselves. But there had been a lag in response time, so the remote had only managed to partially extend their arms. They ended up face-planting onto the concrete, head glancing the curb. Before he could unplug, the shock and pain were immediately transmitted to Johan's brain. At first, he thought the remote had upped the sensitivity level. Some of them did, so renters would be more careful with their bodies. There had been rumors about sympathetic injuries, where renters felt phantom sensations well after a session, but there was never any physical trauma. So, his injury shouldn't have been possible. Johans had been remoting for most of his life, growing up as a well-to-do child of a structural engineer in Blarikum, North Holland. He had been sheltered from the world. Despite the small fortune his parents had spent on psychotherapy, he had never been completely able to overcome his anxiety and agoraphobia. He had started using remotes at the suggestion of a psychologist as a way to confront his fears without physically putting himself in the situations he was trying to avoid. Experiencing the outside world through someone else's body, knowing he could unplug at any time, was supposed to desensitize him. At least, that was the theory. Instead, to the disappointment of his parents and the psychologists, he had never been truly able to overcome his agoraphobia. He just became dependent on remoting, only leaving the safety of their house when it was absolutely unavoidable. Johann's father came to believe he simply wasn't trying hard enough and was being coddled by his mother, who felt guilty about her frequent absences. Her guilt eventually drove her to arrange remotes so Johans could accompany her on inspections of the construction sites where her seawall designs were being built. In turn, this led Johans to pursue a degree in hydraulic engineering and, through the influence of his mother, eventually land a job at Rijkswaterstaat in the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Doing mostly modeling to assess the likelihood of failures in the flood control system meant that Johans could work remotely. It also gave him free access to the entire water management system. On the rare occasion he needed to do a physical inspection, Johans had to take heavy anti-anxiety drugs to get himself out the door, then take a day to recover. After both his parents eventually passed away, Johans inherited the Blaricum house, which he rarely left. Now, sitting, staring at the trail of blood, he was perplexed. How had he been injured? A message icon suddenly flashed on his workstation, pulling his attention away from the mystery. Johans checked the time and realized he was late for a meeting. He quickly ran to the bathroom to clean up. When he got back to his desk, he opened the message window. You're usually not late, 
Merrill, Johan's supervisor, noted, then saw the gash in his forehead. What happened? I was remoting to Venice for the presentation on the new water management system, Johans explained. I got distracted and the remote tripped and hit the ground pretty hard. I'll probably have to pay extra for the medical bills and get a warning added to my cerebral net account, he complained. Which means I'll have to pay a premium for my rentals from now on. Yes, but that still doesn't explain how you injured your head, Merrill pointed out. I'm not sure. I think something went wrong with the interface. It's supposed to put you in temporary paralysis while you are remoting. I think somehow I was actually walking around and really tripped. There were drops of blood on the floor in the hall. Were you in the session all morning? Uh, yeah, it started early. Why do you ask? I thought I saw you coming out of Hilversum train station around 6 a.m. I'm sure it was you. You were in a hurry. I tried to get your attention, but you didn't see me. I thought that maybe you had an early dentist appointment or something. I know how you don't like going out. It had to be someone else, Johans insisted. I rented the remote for the whole day so I could walk around Venice. Before the presentation, I connected in early so I could watch the sun rise over the Grand Canal. Those look like nasty scratches on your hands, Merrill said with concern. You don't want to be blindly walking around while your mind is literally somewhere else. You could get hit by a car or walk in front of a train. You need to get a cerebral net tech out to your place to check your rig. I was going to, Johans replied irritably. He hated how Merrill sometimes treated him like an invalid just because he was agoraphobic. Yes, he was too nervous to go outside, but other than that, he was a totally capable adult. Sorry I'm late. Do you still need me to walk you through my failure analysis of the Virsatam Enhancement Project? He asked. Merrill nodded for him to go ahead. The next day, the support AI at CerebralNet informed Johans there had been no errors logged on his interface that would account for sleepwalking during his latest session. There are multiple layers of security and fault protection, Mr. Boss, it had assured. Safety and security is primary to our corporate mission. There has never been a recorded failure in the last 15 years. However, if you are still concerned, we'd invite you to set up your home security system to record your movements during your next remote. Johans did more than that. He bought a new interface and added several internal cameras to his home system before he dared log in for a weekend in Dominica. He had booked the mini vacation several months before and didn't want to miss it. Getting an ethical rental service in the popular tropical vacation spot was difficult. The one he used only took a small percentage of the fee and guaranteed the remote had voluntarily undergone the implant procedures. There were rumors some less scrupulous agencies kidnapped people from the slums and forced them into service. Turn security on, Johans instructed the house, then placed a transcranial stimulator behind both ears, which magnetically clicked in place over his implants. Then the room dissolved, and he found himself standing at the front entrance to a beach resort, staring at a smartly dressed agent, wearing a light nylon jacket emblazoned with the rental agency's logo. Welcome to Dominica, Mr. Voss. My name is Yamaris. She quickly rattled off an introduction she obviously used with every client. I've already checked you in, so you can go straight to the beach if you want. Your room key is in your pocket. If you have any questions or concerns, please text me. She smiled, then turned to go, but stopped to add. When you drop offline to sleep, Vincent, that's who you've rented, will be allowed to stay in the resort. I just thought you'd want to know that. It cost extra, but paying to have the remote stay made Johans feel better about using a tourist rental. It was late afternoon as he walked along the beach, luxuriating in the feeling of the sun on the remote skin and the warm tropical water on his feet. He stopped and bent over to examine a seashell when he suddenly found himself back in his house. Johans jolted upright, disoriented by the unexpected end to the session. It took him a few moments to recognize the squawking of his house alarm. Turn security off. 
he immediately commanded, then stood up, blinking, while his eyes adjusted to the dim light in the hallway. There was a five-hour difference between Dominica and the Netherlands, where it was already night. Turn hall lights up, he requested. However, his feet felt uncomfortably cold and clammy, like he had been standing in a puddle with his socks on. He looked down to discover that his pant legs were wet up to the mid-shin, and his runners, his runners were caked in mud and soaked through. A washcloth lay abandoned on the floor where he had been using it to wipe up a trail of footprints. After stepping out of his soiled trainers, Johans headed to his home office, booted up his desktop, and logged into his security system. The log showed that the house system had been turned off a few minutes after he had started his remote session, then came back on automatically after eight hours when he hadn't reset it. The only video recorded was a few seconds of him cleaning the hall floor, then jumping up when the alarm went off. The noise of the alarm triggered the disconnect, the support AI explained to Johans. He had contacted support as soon as he had changed clothes and cleaned up the hall. The system is set up to do that in case of a fire or other emergency, the AI added. But obviously I wasn't in paralysis, Johans complained. I was walking around like a zombie. I even left my house. My feet were soaked and my shoes caked with mud. Can you explain that? I could have been injured or worse. All I can do is tell you what was recorded in your session log, the support AI insisted stubbornly. Which shows that aside from a few brief instances, you were inert until the alarm made you drop out. But that's normal. We allow you to move around a bit, otherwise people in long sessions, like yours, would get bed sores. If the session is long enough, we have your body stand up and stretch. In fact, we had you do that twice. I did a bit more than stand up, Johans pointed out angrily. I had to clean up muddy footprints, which, according to your logs, I couldn't have made. There was an intruder then, the AI suggested. That would explain the alarm and the footprints. So how did my pant legs get wet and my shoes get muddy? Johans glared at the message window incredulously, waiting for an answer. When it didn't come, he ended the session in disgust. That's you, isn't it? Merrill asked, freezing the surveillance video so he could see. First thing Monday, Johans had been called into an unexpected meeting. It looks like me, but I can't tell for sure. When was this recorded? Johans sank back in his chair, his anxiety rising. I don't have a big pack like that, and why would I take one on an inspection anyway? All I need is a tablet. It happened Saturday evening. That's why it was flagged, Merrill explained. The site was closed for the weekend. I know you go to great lengths to avoid doing on-site inspections. So when I saw the recording, I thought maybe you had discovered something in your analysis that merited immediate investigation. We both know how critical the Virsatdam project is. An accidental breach would flood a large part of Zealand. I know, but... I haven't found a flaw like that in the design, and I wasn't out there on Saturday. I was in a remote in Dominica, Johans explained, trying to hide the fear that he had indeed been wandering around while his mind was 7,000 kilometers away, not wanting to implicate himself until he understood what was going on. He neglected to mention the recent incident with the footprints. However, he noted the muddy ground at the gate to the project on the screen. The figure, who might or might not be him, was standing in it while they swiped a passkey over the locking mechanism. Doesn't security have a record of whose access card was used? He asked, zooming in on the video to see if there was enough detail in the grainy recording to positively ID the figure. But it had been dusk and the night vision on the system hadn't kicked in yet. No, for some reason the records are corrupted. IT is checking to see if anyone hacked into our system, but so far they found nothing, Merrill said, looking away from the screen, then mumbling something he couldn't make out to someone outside the frame. Who's there with you? he asked nervously. 
head of security, Merrill admitted. We want you to take a look at this. The security video fast-forwarded about 30 minutes. Then, the same figure walked up to the gate from the inside. Seemingly aware of the camera, they had pulled a hood over their head, obscuring their face. Notice anything different? The man, now standing behind Merrill, asked. The hood? Yes, but there's something else, Merrill pointed out. Johann stared at the grainy image for a while. I've never been good at those spot-the-difference games. What changed? The pack, the head of security said impatiently. They aren't carrying the pack, which means it was left somewhere in the site. It's a big place, covers several hectares, and it could be anywhere. You're quite sure you weren't out there over the weekend. He looked accusingly into the camera at Johann's. I can send you the session logs from Cerebral Net if you like, Johans offered. It'll show that my body was in temporary paralysis until I dropped out of the session around 10 p.m. Well, I thought, Merrill stumbled, glancing at the head of security for support. You know, since the incident last week, when you hit your head, you mentioned there is a possibility you might be sleepwalking during your remotes. Couldn't this have been another... No, it couldn't. I checked into that. There are no records of me getting up during a session. I changed interfaces just in case and set up the house system to monitor me. I can assure you my mindless zombie body didn't somehow drive two hours on a busy motorway down to Vir Satam to open a security gate and lose a backpack I've never seen before, he argued, trying to convince himself that the mud on his shoes and his wet feet were just a coincidence. Johans looked at the frozen security cam image again, trying to make out the figure's legs and feet. They weren't visible in the shot. No, it couldn't be him, he decided. It was impossible. The conference call ended, with Johans promising not to remote until he had a tech from Cerebral Net come over and physically check his rig. A few days later, Johans was leaning against his front door, thoroughly exhausted by a short trip to the grocery. The anti-anxiety drugs he was trying simply didn't work. None ever had. Going out was as bad now as it had been when he was young, maybe worse, since there was no one around anymore insisting he go out on a regular basis to desensitize. He desperately wanted to remote instead but he couldn't afford another incident before his rig was checked out by an expert. He suspected Riek Swatterstadt security still believed he had been the person in the video. They couldn't prove it and had yet to find the pack the intruder had left behind. The fact they were concerned about it made Johans angry. If it had been him sleepwalking, the pack was probably just full of groceries. Johans sniffed the air. For a brief instant, he thought he could smell the scent of stale cigarettes, like the invisible trail left by the clothes of a heavy smoker. House, turn main floor lights on. Were there any deliveries while I was out? He asked the automation system. The lights came up, and the house informed him that it didn't know if anyone had come by because security had not been on. On the rare occasions he went out, Johans never forgot to set the alarm. But now, overwhelmed by the horror of having to physically run errands instead of remoting, his mind had been muddled. He shrugged it off, chastising himself for being so distracted, then took off his coat and made his way to his office. There, he was surprised to find that his computer was already on. Was that another result of his panicked state of mind, he wondered. Johann sat down and was about to turn the computer off when a notification popped up. He had apparently sent a video message to himself. Curious, he opened it, revealing a man with long salt and pepper hair pulled back into a ponytail, sitting in his chair in his office, talking to the computer's camera. Good afternoon, Johans, the strange man said. You don't know me, but... I've been following your career since your mother got you into the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. I'm especially interested in your work on the Vir Saddam Heightening Project. 
The man stopped to take a drink from a thermos, then wiped his mouth with a handkerchief. Johans looked at the spot on his desk where the man had placed the thermos and noticed a ring of moisture. A shiver went up his back. The man must have been there only a few minutes ago. You still here? He called out nervously. I can get security here in minutes. No one answered, but that didn't mean he was alone. I'll be gone by the time you view this, the man on the screen explained. I'm here to accomplish three things. First, to make you aware of how easy it is for me to access your home. I can come and go as I want. I've even watched you while you're remote. Second, if you tell anyone about me, I have incriminating evidence which ties you to several local crimes. Thirdly, I've noticed you have not been using the cerebral net recently. Not since your little vacation. And yes, I have the capability to monitor your sessions, so I know if you don't follow my directions. You will be doing another session this weekend. To convince you to cooperate, I insist that you watch a short video clip. It's from a security camera. For now, I've removed it from the police surveillance system. But if you don't help me, I'll ensure it gets back into the archive files and is found. The screen went blank. Then a grainy video appeared of the Hilversum train station platform. The timestamp in the corner of the screen said 5.30 a.m. The train station was empty, except for two figures, some middle-aged man he didn't recognize, and himself. He was stunned as he watched his doppelganger approach the man from behind, knock him over, then attempt to rob him. The man fought back, hitting Johans on the forehead hard enough to open a cut. Johans stumbled, scraping both his hands in the process, and then he ran for an exit. I assume you remember those injuries. The stranger on the video smiled fairly. The other times, there was nothing you would recall. In fact, you've had quite the crime spree. However, I've made sure there is no evidence implicating you. At least as long as you cooperate. You see, I've hacked your cerebral net connection and, well, hopefully it's obvious, I've been remoting you. You'll find a name and connection details of a remote at the end of this message. I want you to use them this Sunday. The video ended. Johans felt an anxiety attack come on and fainted. That Sunday, Johans found himself sitting in the driver's seat of a sedan parked a few blocks from his Blaricum house. The interior was rank with the smell of stale cigarette smoke. Looking in the rearview mirror, he saw the face of the man in the video message reflected back. He had remoted to his hijacker's body. Beside him, on the passenger seat, was a large backpack, identical to the one he had seen in the security video from the construction site. As instructed, he waited until he saw himself, or rather his body, approach the car. It was an odd sensation to witness yourself from an outside perspective. Usually, a remote's mind was unconscious when a renter was in control. Remoting to another person to watch your body being driven around wasn't supposed to be allowed on the cerebral net as it compromised a renter's privacy. But he was doing just that, watching his body walk toward the car. Johans was surprised by how at ease he appeared to be. He could never have been that relaxed and confident walking down a street. His remote self opened the rear passenger door and got in. Okay, let's go, it said. Johans pulled away from the curb and headed out of his neighborhood to the A-27, then turned south toward Zeeland. They drove in silence, Johans periodically checking the rearview mirror to watch his body. Whoever was in control of it tried to avoid his eyes by looking out the side window at the flat green countryside rolling by. Finally, not being able to stand the silence, Johans tried to start a conversation. So, why did you want me here if all I'm going to do is drive you to Vir's Hattam? The remoter let the question hang for an uncomfortable amount of time before answering. To complete the story I've been building, he said. What story? That you're willingly collaborating with me. 
There are four CCD cameras between your house and where I parked. Anyone who knows you and sees the video will understand how much willpower that would take. No one will suspect you were being remoted. Also, I can't control two bodies at once, so I needed someone to drive. The person controlling his body refused to say anything more, and they drove on in silence. Two hours later, Johans pulled the car off the road and into a parking lot at the northeast corner of the construction site. Several massive foundation drilling rigs silently loomed inside the fenced-off area. Beyond, the old Virsat Dam extended two kilometers roughly southwest, cutting the estuary off from the ocean. It was an asphalt-topped dike built on a former sandbar in the 1960s as part of the Delta Works water management system. Most of Zealand was below sea level, so it played a crucial role in keeping the area dry. A new, taller, and stronger barrier was being built inside the old dike. With the increasingly extreme storms churned up by the warming waters of the North Sea and rising sea levels, the whole Delta Work system was being upgraded. Look in the pack, then hand it to me when I ask you. The remoter in Johann's body instructed, then got out and opened the front passenger door. Johans did as he was told and opened the top of the backpack. He found a military-style metal case inside. It had yellow radiation stickers on it and writing in what he assumed to be Russian. It's a suitcase nuke, the remoter explained. Very low yield. I'm not interested in irradiating anyone, just making a point. He nodded to the construction site. I'm going to take that mini nuke over to one of the finished foundation holes and drop it in. They'll fill the hole with concrete on Monday. Oh, don't look so surprised. It was easy to get your access codes and use them to check the construction schedule. Foundation hole B26 is ready to be filled. I remoted you two weeks ago to plant another mini nuke in A17. They're old Soviet devices which I bought on the black market. It turns out the rumor was true. Several of them disappeared in the chaos when the USSR dissolved. They were expensive, but necessary. Once the concrete has cured, I'll set the devices off. I don't want any of the explosion to reach the surface. This is meant to be an underground event. Their detonation will cause a localized earthquake strong enough to liquefy the sand under the existing Virsa Dam and cause the dike to collapse. The sea will pour into the old estuary. There will be no way to stop it. But that'll flood the reclaimed land in the area. Tens of thousands will lose their homes, Johans protested. Why are you doing this? To make a point and get the world's attention, the remoter said. I come from an island that's disappearing beneath the waves. For decades, we've been asking the rich industrial countries for help to stop the sea level rise. When that was ignored, we pleaded for the financial resources to move to somewhere else. Oh sure, there were vague promises given at all the international conferences, but nothing ever happened, and my country is now doomed. So I've taken matters into my own hands to arrange a demonstration of what my island is facing, one that can't be ignored. I've told you enough. Now, hand me the backpack. When Johans refused to move, the remoter angrily reached in and grabbed it. Don't leave if you want your body back in working condition, he threatened. Just remember, it's my hack, and I have the pain feedback turned off. I'll feel nothing if your body gets injured. Stunned, Johans watched as the remoter struggled to get the heavy backpack on, then started to walk toward the construction site. Suddenly, he knew what he had to do, and for the first time in his life, wasn't afraid to act. He started the car. His body turned around and yelled something at him, but Johans couldn't hear what the man was threatening, and he didn't care. He put the car in gear, floored the accelerator, and aimed straight at himself. You 
you can help support the podcast by heading over to patreon.com. The link is in the show notes. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. This episode of Makeshift Stories is brought to you by the Edmonton Community Foundation. The Edmonton Community Foundation acts as a bridge between donors and charities to create a strong, vibrant community for generations to come. You can start an endowment fund yourself or with a group, and once it reaches $10,000, it can distribute funds. The foundation publishes Vital Signs, an annual checkup, in partnership with Edmonton Social Planning Council to measure how the community is doing. The 2022 report focuses on systemic racism in Edmonton. You can learn more at ecfoundation.org. This episode of Makeshift Stories is also brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by getting your friends to subscribe or follow wherever they listen to audio. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.